Welcome to the Digital Amateur Television Experimenters Night. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. Amateur radio is a worldwide hobby that has many different aspects. Digital television is just one of the many modes and areas that are covered. Maybe you're interested in becoming involved in the DATV Experimenters Nights. You realise that you do not have to be a radio amateur or need any ATV equipment to participate anywhere in the world. Also participate in the night by coming up to the Queen's Domain Club Rooms. Yes, right on top of the Queen's Domain in the Heritage Listed Coast Wireless Station. You never know, we might get you in front of the camera or behind doing one of the many roles during the night. We get underway with our program on a Wednesday night from 7.30pm local time. We'll see you soon. This is VK7 OTC. Okay, this is VK7 uh, OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania with our DATV Experimenters Night. And uh, we're coming to you from the DATV studio, VK7 Tango Whiskey at the microphone. And I apologise to, uh, to our viewers because uh, they may have had to have chased me around the place uh, a little bit. Uh, we had to uh, restart OBS, and when you restart OBS, uh, it uh, <laughs> decides to uh, 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 go, uh, park every all the, uh, the broadcasts you've set up. So uh, apologies if you've been following me around. Um, okay, I wish to uh, acknowledge uh, Tasmanian Aboriginal peoples, the traditional owners of the land uh, upon which we present tonight, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging for they hold the memories, the knowledge, and the culture and hopes of Aboriginal Tasmania. Okay, we've got a little bit of a, a different uh, different program tonight. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things we're uh, we're going to be doing a little bit on is this funny thing that's sitting in front of me, um, and I've tried to I've, I've tried to uh, set up a camera, uh, I, and you can probably see just off off to the uh, the side here. Set up a camera so that you could actually see what I'm seeing, and I abjectly failed. So, I, 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 you're going to have to believe me with my description. Uh, hello to Ken uh, over in uh, New Zealand, uh, and uh, e evening to all, and Happy New Year. And of course, Happy New Year. This is uh, the third uh, third day of 2024. So, uh, so we're in our our new year and uh, looking uh, looking forward. So. What are we looking at here? Um, and I'll uh, what I'll do is 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 uh, I think no, that's not going to do it for me. Uh, what am I going to have to do here? Uh, we are on. Ah, <laughs> we are on. If I go to here, that's a bit better. Okay, uh, and hello to Ron. Uh, yes, happy uh, Happy New Year to uh, to Ron as well. Now, um, what we're looking at here is uh, what is called a Neo Lucida. Um, now, Neo obviously means new, uh, and Lucida is, uh, and I'll explain and go into a little bit of history, and then explain how it works, and then we're going to try and do a, uh, a particular drawing with it. 
What a Neo Lucida is, is it enables you to trace the what you see. So what you've got in front of you, um, if you're if you're very good at drawing, you can look at what's there, you can look at the placement of what's in front of you and the perspective of where it is, so you've got depth and all sorts of things. And you can then translate that depth and, and what you're seeing onto a page. Um, if you're not so good at drawing, like myself, <laughs> then these devices are really, really handy. They, basically what they enable you to do is to trace exactly what you're looking at in front of you if you if you set these up um, there's much debate about whether the masters um, and we're talking about the the the, the realistic painting so as as um, art went into the renaissance there were some very realistic paintings that were done which had portraits were uh, were were incredibly accurate they went for accuracy rather than um, rather than abstract. Uh, that that came much much later into the, the the modern art era, but they went for realism. So what they were looking for was a, an absolutely realistic representation of what they were looking at, either whether it was a landscape or whether it was a portrait or whatever they were looking at. Now there's a big debate about whether they used these devices, which were around from the, there were. Optics, uh, they were linked to the availability of um, optics. So as lenses became available, we're talking about the 13th century, so the 1400s, as lenses became available uh, and they were used for all sorts of different things, um, they suddenly saw in the art world um, the this realistic... Uh, this realistic view of art and so th there's a big debate and, and there is a what, what's called the Hockney Falco thesis uh, David Hockney and, and uh, a guy called Falco um, did a whole lot of research into the old masters and and um, their theory their, their thesis put that they were actually using things like Lucinda's, and there was a camera Lucinda, and I'll, I'll um, Lucida, and I'll um, I'll go into what that is uh, in a in a short while. But the earliest that one of these devices was was uh, seen was, and I'll go to here, um, the the history. So we're talking about. 1806, there was a um, patent taken out by Sir William Hyde Wollaston uh, for a camera lucida. And you can see on the screen there, uh, you've got Wollaston sitting there uh, looking down through the lens uh, of this device. And he's, he's got his sketchbook underneath and he's sketching, uh, sketching basically or tracing what he's actually seeing. So, so, and... There is a uh, now uh, patented the camera lucida. Now, if I follow this particular link, it's got a great little uh, and there's plenty of information in here. This is what I want. So, this was the diagram that accompanied Wollaston's patent, and you can see what it, what the device basically is is a 45 degree mirror. And you can see that goes from B to D. There's a little line there. But there's a 45 degree half silvered mirror. So what half silvering means is you can see through the mirror. Uh, but it is also reflecting what it's seeing at that 45 degree angle. So you look down through the top. And what you're seeing is a combination of what you, what you are seeing in front of you via the 45 degree mirror. And you're actually looking through that image onto the, the, the paper that is underneath it, which is straight below. And so what you're effectively doing is tracing the lines of what you're seeing in front of you. So that's, that's what a, 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 a Lucida 
uh, they call a camera lucida is. So, so. 18, uh, 1806, uh, so we're talking about a fair while ago, they became really, really popular, many, many people use them, architects use them, artists use them, all sorts of people use them, um, and it, it, it's, it's very similar to what they called a camera obscura. Now, you may have heard of a camera obscura. Uh, camera obscuras were basically, uh, they looked very similar, they were boxes, uh, looked like cameras, they had a lens on the front, and they had a 45 degree, uh, 45 degree um, uh, 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 board that you would put your paper onto, and the image would come through the lens, be flipped over, ups would be upside down, and would appear on the 45 degree um, uh white surface and quite a number of the uh, there were quite a number of camera obscuras around the place they they used to go to fairs uh, they were set up in little tents uh, where everyone would gather in the dark tent and and they they had a lens that went up through the center of the um, uh, center of the tent and the lens would take the scene that it, it was the mirror at the top was looking for it would do 45 degrees into the tent and be um, on the on the, um, be on the board in front of all these people, and you could turn the the mirror around so that you could see uh, do a three hundred and sixty degree turn of what you were looking at wherever the, uh, the the tent was placed. So that's what a camera obscura was, and all of this led to what we know as a camera these days, where there is film on the on the the back plane. Uh, and the, the image is then uh, put onto the film. In, in these days with digital cameras, it's, it's, a, it's a CCD array, uh, and the, the image is then transferred um, to a, an array of colour sensors, uh, and they are then transferred into uh, what we see as pictures. So the Lucida, um, the camera Lucida, uh, and then um, you... And the interesting thing, the interesting thing is... Um, from a camera lucida point of view, um, why why would you actually do this? Why why would you need this? Why would you actually go to this trouble of having a device and coming up with all of these different um, these different uh, devices to enable you to draw? But there's a great section, and I'll I'll include the links to this in the um, in the in the, um, the the video notes, but. <laughs> It says everyone can learn to draw and you hear so many people say I can't draw I just can't draw I try to draw accurately and I really can't do uh, anything and it says here drawing accurately from life is hard so if you want that accuracy um, it, it's unless you uh, unless you're able to basically put uh, put your predetermined image in your mind out of your mind, um, it is very hard to draw accurately. And, and one of the key things that you need to, to, to do is break an image down into a series of dark and shade, a series of lines. So there are what you look at, there are a series, lots of series of lines, and they're all related and they're proportional and everything like that. And then there's lots of shades from, you know, from black to white and everything in between. Um, and then there is lots of edges uh, and lots of colours, lots of different colours that you're looking at. And you need to be able to break all that down into those components and then be able to draw. And there's a, there's a wonderful... Um, you, 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 and in most cases, if you try and draw something that's in front of you, you can't actually look at the drawing and also do the, the, the actual um, drawing at the same time. You're looking up, you're seeing the scene, you're doing an interpretation and then you're putting it onto a piece of paper uh, down here. And in that process, you're doing an interpretation through your brain and to your, your finger that's holding the pencil. And there's a wonderful thing called uh, the Thatcher effect. And... You can see here on the screen we've got um, we've got two faces which are 
seemingly exactly the same face. But on the right hand side face, there's been some changes done to it. Namely, the lips are upside down and the eyes are upside down. Now, when you look at that image, as it is, they look pretty similar. They actually don't look very different at all. If I flip them over, so they're actually the right way up, you can see the differences. And so there's an interesting, interesting thing here where if you flip it upside down, so you're not used to seeing a face upside down. So you don't have these, these sort of predefined ideas of what a face is all about. But if you flip it over so that you look at it like you would normally look at a normal face, then you can see the differences. And so one of the things, it, what it's trying to do is indicate that if you are able to clear your mind of any of the interpretive skills that you, you have when you do a drawing, um, you can probably draw more accurately because you don't have all of these predefined things in your mind about what it should be and where it should be and how far away it should be and all of this sort of stuff. So absolutely fascinating little exercise. Um, uh, and it's called the Thatcher effect. Um, uh, and so, so if you're able to actually literally trace what you're looking at, then you're a whole lot closer to actually being able to draw accurately. And so that's what we, we get to. We now get to the Neo Lucida. So this was a crowdfunded project. Um, it, uh, it is basically a re, uh, a re realizing of an, a camera Lucida. Um, it is really nicely made. Uh, comes with a clamp. Comes with a, um, a, a an arm that you can you can bend into whatever shape you want. The basic model, which is what I've got here, is the little uh, forty five degree half silvered mirror, and it enables you to put it at the right angle. Uh, you can also transfer it over so that you can come in the other side and you can screw it into the other side. So. Um, left or right-handed, I suppose you'd say it is. Uh, nice clamp that you can clamp to the table, so everything's stable. Um, you have a you have a, a little guide that it comes with that's got a little cutout in it that is at the 45 degrees. So what you're looking at is this is your paper along here, and if you put this onto the the mirror here, and you you get the the 45 degrees at the right angle and this parallel to your paper which is on the desk uh, then you've got you've got it set to pretty close to where you need to be so what I'm going to do and I, I this is a bit of an experiment here so please 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 bear with me <laughs> this is live television what I've got is a I think yes okay so this is the paper that's in front of me, and I've got the Neo Lucida uh, just <laughs> literally just above me, um, and I'm I'm able to look down through it at the 45 degrees. So what what I was going to do, and I'll zoom out a little bit here. If we zoom all the way out, you can see here's the um, here's the Neo Lucida here, and. I'm, uh, what I'm looking at, and I'll show you what I'm looking at in a minute uh, in comparison to what I end up drawing. Um, if I look straight down, so I'm looking straight down at the... Hang on, I'll just... There we go. Okay, now let's get that to focus there we go and zoom in here a little bit so I'm going to be drawing right about there so let's just there we go as I said this is live television <laughs> so what I do is I'm looking straight down, so straight down past the 45 degree mirror. The 45 degree mirror is showing me what's in front of me. And what I can do 
is I'll just do a little adjustment here what I can do is I draw exactly what's in front of me so and I'll, I'll do this really quickly and I'll end up showing you so that's that there's a I think there there's a line there there's a big lens there with a bigger surround uh, there's a that there's another camera which sits in front of me looks a bit like that and all I'm doing is literally tracing out the lines there there there's a bit of a there um, there's some cords and bits and pieces there I won't draw too much of that and there that is all sitting on a bench which is there so <laughs> that was really quick so you can see you can see I have literally traced what's sitting in front of me now let me turn the camera around so that you can actually see what I was looking at whoops what I was looking at <laughs> so <laughs> so that is the camera I'm looking at the two cameras and if I can't come in here that was the large camera sitting next to the little camera just here <laughs> now if I was a bit a, a bit slower at doing this I could actually I could actually get, be a whole lot more accurate accurate than that and I'll show you some examples of um, <laughs> of where uh, where uh, I, I've been uh, spent a little bit more time um, a little bit more time on now let me go back here and go to okay so let's zoom out here and I'll show you some examples where I've spent a little bit more time now this this is a line drawing which I have done let me just make sure that's focused a bit better this is of uh, an Aboriginal face uh, that I had on the screen and I literally did it with a biro um, I was tracing out all of the detail uh, that was in the face um, as a line drawing and he had a hat on um, all sorts of different um, uh, different experiments here a little uh, anime character uh, different figures uh, a hand now hands are notoriously hard to draw uh, and to get them in the right proportions um, you can see some more some more figures uh, and also another hand here holding a pen that was actually my hand holding a pen <coughs> oh pardon sorry about that some dust in here um, some that I did last night this is uh, real life there, there's a candelabra that was sitting on the table this is a picture of my son he'll probably be horrified by this um, and there was some there's a reesed mug sitting there and some other bits and pieces here's a um, here's a parrot um, that uh, that was on a card uh, and it was all done with tracing uh, tracing bits and pieces so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd show you a, a, a Neo Neo Lucida um, and uh, <laughs> it's a little device uh, from America it comes uh, comes with its own little uh, cover and everything that you can you can uh, put it into to protect it um, there is a, an upmarket version called a camera Lucida um, which it has a, a much larger uh, 45 degree mirror and a few other things it's a little bit easier to use now just excuse me oh, there's some dust I've upset some dust in here um, 
so um, there is a, a, a range of uh, a range of them. Um, if we uh, go to um, if we go to I think is that the right one? No. Oh, sorry. We go to we go to a transition here. You can see what I'm looking at. Um, we can go to ah. Why isn't that? Why isn't that doing what we hoped it would do? Let's go back here. Every so often, this decides to not follow what's on the screen. Just let me do a bit of a reset here. No, it's not going to give it to us. Well, that's disappointing. That's very disappointing. Um, for some reason, that USB video oh there we go so there are a range uh, this is the the one that I'm talking about um, uh, that I've got you can, and you can see that's a that's a it, it's showing it a little bit uh, a little bit enlarged there is the XL uh, which is apparently is a little bit easier to use um, and then there is the new, and this 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 has only just been released. The Neo Lucida Plus, which is um, a sort of a combination of the two in between. And there there are kits and all sorts of stuff. You can buy pencils and all all sorts of things with it. But and and you can see here, um, the Neo Lucida is fifty nine dollars US. Uh, the upmarket version is the eighty nine dollars. Um, and then there is the uh, the the Neo Lucida Plus. Um, that is available. Really, really well made, uh, exceptionally well made, um, and so yeah, you, you've got a uh, you've got a device that is certainly going to uh, to last the distance. But uh, anyway, that's something I, I thought a little bit a little bit different uh, to uh, to show you <laughs> um, the the Neo Lucida. And now, um, uh, hello to Andy. Hello, uh, Happy New Year from Andy and David um, and Andrew and Lionel. So uh, it's a <laughs> it's something a little bit different, and not not amateur radio related either. I, I I'm 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 um, using a little bit of uh, license here uh, to show you something that uh, I hope you'll uh, you'll be interested in. And can I just say it is it is really old technology um we're talking about technology that was actually uh, patented back in 1806 uh so uh, the patents are well and truly gone um but it is the precursor to the camera uh, and the lens systems that we have these days so it is what uh what what created those uh, those systems and what were then developed into cameras and telescopes and microscopes and all sorts of things so uh, really interesting and um, so old technology okay um, now <laughs> uh, mag loops um, now the the mag loop this is well and truly um, uh, getting to the stage it's about to go into its housing uh, and be permanently mounted. Uh, th this is the coupling ring now, uh, and this is the final coupling ring. This is with a, a little bit of uh, LDF uh, 4 uh, FSJ450. FSJ450. So this is the super flexible stuff. Um, that's the coupling loop. It comes out to a, a, an end type. Uh, basically, it's tied, cable tied on. Uh, there's a little bit of a, um, uh, a little bit of Plastic that makes sure that the uh, the distance between those two uh, those two sides of the coupling loop stay the same. Uh, there is a bit of st um, st structural stability uh, here, um, and th these are cable tied on both sides, and it's also cable tied to the base of the uh, uh, base of the vacuum capacitor around here. So this is really this doesn't move at all. 
there is a housing that goes on here. There's a 100 mil PVC pipe that goes on here. Both sides, I've taken a little bit of a different approach than what I used uh, with the bigger loop uh, in that the housing is cut down the side uh, and I put one side on and continue, uh, put basically two sides together and make it uh, vaguely waterproof um, and to... Uh, to keep uh, keep that moisture out, especially in the top of the uh, where the vacuum capacitor is, because you don't want the water getting in there, and um, uh, you don't want the water getting in and changing. Number one, changing your capacitance, uh, but number two is um, uh, water getting in there and starting to corrode the connections uh, that you need an absolutely low ohmic. Uh, omic um, uh, arrangement with uh, to make sure that your your capacitance your capacitance and the Q of your antenna remains the same. Now, if I do this, uh, if I do that. Ah, oh, that's better. So, let me zoom in here. I did some nano VNA uh, work with um, that's better. Um, now this is oh that's very hard to see, isn't it? Um, so this is at fifty four megahertz. This is fifty four megahertz. That's where that uh, that that um, that peak there is at fifty four megahertz. I've got uh, an SWR of one point three eight, so that's pretty reasonable and also you'll notice 60 megahertz is here which is what I've designed it for so there is a little bit of headroom there if we if I get stray capacitance up at the top then um, then I don't have to worry about it suddenly moving too far and going outside of the range that I've designed it for um, let me go to no no ah so that's 54 that's 54. This is coming down to 50, and we've got 1.34 to 1. Uh, so that's I'm very happy with that. Very. Uh, let me see whether I can get the. Let me go to black and white. No, I can't get that. Uh, let me go to negative. No, it's <laughs> it's that that picture that picture there. Oh, that's a bit better. Uh, Anyway, you, you're going to have to believe me. This is 54. This is 50. Let's come down. This is 29.2. So this is up near the top of the 10 meter band. So this is this has come all the way down the, the frequency spectrum. What we're looking at here is a scale from 20 megahertz to 60 megahertz. Um, this is 28. So this is the bottom of the 10 meter band. And then we go down to 24.4. Uh, so this is 18 meters um, and then we come down to 15 meters and this is 21.2 and at 21.2 we're at 1.74 I'm not that worried about the SWR you can um, through the vacuum capacitor get that much much better uh, but that is um, that is the uh, uh, the the sweep that I, the quick sweep I did basically sitting it on a chair uh, the chair had a minimum amount of ferrous metal in it, um, so that's um, that's the um, <laughs> the nano VNA of that particular loop um, of that particular loop. If we go to that particular loop, have it next to me. That particular loop, uh, and I've got to be happy with that because I I designed it for uh, basically sixty. Uh, to 20, 20 to 60 megahertz, and it seems to be performing pretty well. And that particular capacitor, spot on. That's a five kilovolt capacitor, and at um, at a couple of those frequencies, uh, I need five kilovolts of isolation because uh, you've got five kilovolts up at this up at this end of the antenna at 100 watts. So you really do need to be a little bit careful about the top of that antenna, and that's why it's up out of the way. Um, so, very happy. Got to be, got to be happy with that. Got to be happy with that. Now, Jubus Magazine. How are we going for time? Twenty oh five. Okay. 
So, um, Jubis Magazine, one of the things that I was going to show you is the main article, the main article for, uh, which is featured on the front of the, of the magazine. Let me zoom out here and go to... Zoom, keep zooming out, Justin. Okay. Now, this is by our friend, Charlie Suckling, who is now DL3WDG. Uh, used to be in the UK. Uh, was G4WDG, I think. Um, he's got a wonderful article here about designing, building, and testing feeds for offset feed dishes. Uh, the offset feed dishes, as in the, um, the, the satellite television uh, dishes. And you can see there's a range here. This is a mesh one. Uh, this uses brass sheeting, uh, and you can see, and he goes through using the HDL antenna designing uh, software uh, from W1G8Z from Paul Wade, um, and he goes through the design, he then goes through the the mechanics of it and the, the sheets uh, that you need to, uh, you then need to transfer to the brass sheet or the, uh, the, uh, the mesh. And you can see he's doing all of this and, and marking it out and then cutting it and folding it up uh, and uh, all of the techniques used for doing that and then soldering everything up together uh, and then alignment tools uh, for the 10 gigahertz horns uh, and you can see here he's got the, the alignment tools that go down the throat of the, uh, the feed and he, here's the alignment tool for the 5.7 gig um, and you can see he's doing some testing here on the uh, on the dish. So he's tack soldered, uh, tack soldered these uh, these horns on, then aligns them, and then uh, solders them up for good. Goes through um, some more uh, how to uh, how to do the, uh, the 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 wire, and cut all that that out, and then how to uh, how to sweat solder that on. Um, more testing. You can see here's his alignment tool down here. Quick jig release to identify optimum feed point for the uh, for the uh, offset feed for the offset feed dish. So uh, absolutely fantastic. And offset feed dishes I see at resource tip shops all the time. Um, and so <laughs> they're uh, they and they're quite cheap. They're being thrown out by resource tip shops. Um, in fact, some resource tip shops don't even take them anymore because they're not even worth the scrap value, uh, which I think is really, really sad. So, uh, But anyway, that's another one out of the latest Jubus magazine. This is uh, number four, 2023. So this is the last quarter uh, for Jubus. Um, and if you're into microwave uh, experimentation, this is the magazine you need to, uh, to get. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, let me know and I'll pass on Alan Devlin's uh, contact details. He is... Uh, VK3 XPD who organises Jubus in Australia. Now, what appeared in my uh, post office box, uh, in my post, uh, in my letterbox uh, yesterday, was the latest Low Key magazine. Now, Low Key is the VK QRP Club uh, magazine. It is um, fantastic read, um, and if you're into experimentation, QRP. Uh, CW Ops, etc., then uh, low key is fantastic. Uh, and it's for the princely sum of $15 a year. And you get a fantastic, um, a fantastic little magazine every couple of months. Now, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but one of the things I'm just going to point out here is each year they run the Max Brug Brunger uh, Award for the Best Technical Article. And um, there is Nick Chandler, VK7 Whiskey Whiskey, was uh, for a uh, featured two article technical articles um, specifically to encourage people to new to building radios to give it a try. The project was for the Northern Tasmanian Amateur Radio Club, and it was called the Cent for the centenary um, for the centenary. Um, and uh, for the VK7 centenary. Uh, the project has been pretty popularly received 
and we have an update for you in this edition. The second was contributed by me and is therefore not eligible for the award. The award for the best technical article for 2023 I am directing to Nick Chandler, VK7 Whiskey Whiskey. His article ticks all the boxes for eligibility for the award. It's a fun project specifically targeting people interested in QRP operating and building their own radio to do it. What you didn't see behind the scenes is just how much information Nick sent me for the project. More photos than I could have used and a number of different ways I could take the article. So, congratulations to Nick, uh, who took out the Max Brunger Award uh, for the VKQRP Club. Uh, and we'll go through some other, uh, some other articles out of this magazine in uh, future, future ATV nights. But... Um, that's uh, <laughs> congratulations to uh, to Nick VK uh, VK seven double scotch. So uh, so there you go. Now uh, just to finish off, um, we do have haha, we do have a space weather warning. Um, so there is a space weather warning right at the moment. Uh, a small one, uh, not a large one. Um, it's a HF fade out uh, uh, fade out warning. Uh, for the 1st, 2nd and 3rd of January, there are R2 activities, a chance of an R3, so it going one up. Uh, probable HF comms fade out. Uh, if comms difficulties experienced, then go up in frequency. And we just had tonight, before the uh, ATV night, we installed the antenna uh, for the 10 metre uh, voting receiver. Uh, we've had the 10 metre a repeater that Hayden's installed uh, now has a voting receiver uh, installed just out here uh, and the VK2s I, I understand are already using it so <laughs> there you go uh, there's voting receivers in, in the same places as repeater 2 so for those in Hobart um, there is a, a voting receiver both on Mount Wellington uh, here at Grey Mountain down near Signet uh, they all listen for the uh, the strongest signal, and they who, whichever one is the strongest gets to to provide the received signal, and then everything goes out via um, via Grey Mountain. I think that's where the um, I, I think that's right. I, I I stand corrected on that, or it, may, it might be Mount Lloyd uh, goes the the actual transmitting stations on uh, in another location. So uh, so that was put up tonight. So. Um, uh, Solar Cycle 25 is looking pretty uh, pretty impressive at this point in time. So there you go. Um, reminder: February the seventh, uh, we've got our presentation night, which is Surf Lifing, uh, Life Saving Surf Tasmania. Um, Greg Bird is giving us a presentation on the Tasmanian Surf Life Saving Radio Network. And uh, February the eighteenth, Sunday, which is a Sunday, the Reist AGM and Special General Meeting. So that's what's coming up, and we're running these nights all the way through January and February and on into 2024. So that's our uh, that's your blooming lot for tonight. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you, you got a bit of a blast out of the, the Neo Lucida. <laughs> really uh, interesting device, and um, and you can you can fool yourself that you can draw <laughs> draw reasonably well. So there you go. Um, uh, I, and I, I am definitely not a portrait artist, but anyway, so there you go. Um, 73, have a good week and uh, again, happy, uh, happy new year, uh, for, uh, the third day of 2024. We'll catch you, uh, next time.